Good morning, Union Church of Bay Ridge and all who have joined us through the gift of technology. It is so good to be back with you once again in the house of praise and worship uh, together, though we may be apart, on this 13th Sunday of Ordinary Time. Here again, the reassurance of our Holy Scriptures in this time of change and uncertainty. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Psalm 46. Amen. And let us now focus hearts and minds on the worship of our God. And hear the call to worship today from Psalm 89. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you? You rule the raging of the sea. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Happy are those who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exult in your name and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. Let us worship God. Let us now hear the prayer of invocation followed by our hymn of praise. take a moment in our worship to pause and go to our God in confession together. Our scriptures assure us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us then come before our gracious Lord 
to confess our sin, praying together. Holy and most merciful God, we humbly come before you to confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and that we have not loved you with all our heart, soul, and strength. We haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. God of grace, we ask you to forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and by your mercy guide what we shall be, so that we may walk in the way of your will and do those things which are pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let's take a moment of silent confession together. And all God's people said together, Amen. Friends, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. So then let us proclaim the good news of the gospel together and say it right where you are. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, having received such great peace from our awesome God, it is uh, right that we pass that peace to one another. And you can do this right where you are at home if you're worshiping with others, but I want to say to you now, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Um, it's announcement time in our worship. And uh, just a few today. Uh, I want to give a final reminder on the two annual special offerings we're currently receiving. Um, the first is our denomination's Pentecost offering, which supports ministries across our denomination focused on the development of children and on youth and young adult ministries uh, locally and across the U.S. And the second offering is our offering for Presbyterian parity to support their advocacy and justice ministries with LGBTQ communities. Uh, we ask that you prayerfully discern how you might give over and above your regular offerings at this time for these special offerings. Uh, normally, on this fourth Sunday of June each year, uh, we begin worshiping in what we call the upper room uh, for the summer. Uh, but the coronavirus has, of course, changed how we do everything right now. And I'm glad to continue leading you right here in our sanctuary as we worship each week. Um, another change we're glad for is that normally the choir would be off for the summer now entirely, but we are going to be joined each week by one of the choir members uh, to help Nana and me to provide you the best virtual worship that we can. Uh, we're joined today by our baritone, Jay Chacon, so thank you, Jay. Um, and you'll see that to lighten the solo choir members' load a little each week, we won't be singing our usual hymn of parting over the summer, but uh, most of the service will remain the same. Next, I'm sure you all know that New York City is now in phase two of reopening the economy, uh, and you may also know that means that a congregation of our size, a little congregation, uh, legally could return to in-person worship, legally. Uh, you may be wondering about our plans here, and the simplest answer is to let everybody know that they have not changed. Um, the leadership does not feel comfortable from the standpoint of your health and well-being, uh, for even the potential of anyone getting sick if we can prevent it, um, because there are still so many unknowns about this virus, aren't there, folks? Um, we're seeing in places around the country that are trying to reopen uh, that there's reinfection happening. Um, if, if I could wager a guess, we probably aren't looking at any time prior to the beginning of September uh, for returning to live worship together. Um, the session continues to meet over the summer. Uh, usually we take the summer off, so to speak, but we're going to continue uh, meeting each month so that we can discern when we might return to live worship and what we'll need to do to keep the church clean, hygienic, and safe for everyone and what you are going to need to do as well uh, when we return together. So lastly, as always, remember as your pastor, I am here for you. Um, whether it's to pray, just talk, or to vent, uh, call on me, I, I would ask you, as you would like. 
Uh, Now let's continue in worship by turning to the proclamation of God's holy word. Let us hear now our prayer of illumination. us from the prophet Jeremiah, uh, the 27th chapter of Jeremiah, beginning with the first two verses, and then we'll go to chapter 28, beginning at the first verse as well. Listen for the word of God. In the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus the Lord said to me, make yourself a yoke of straps and bars and put them on your neck. In chapter 28, in that same year, at the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azor from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place King Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim of Judah, and all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, This is how I will break the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon from the neck of all the nations within two years. At this, the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Sometime after the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go, tell Hananiah, says the Lord, you have broken wooden bars only to forge iron bars in place of them. For thus does the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put an iron yoke on the neck of all these nations so that they may serve King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and they shall indeed serve him. I have even given him the wild animals. And the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you 
And you made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am going to send you off the face of the earth. Within this year, you will be dead because you have spoken rebellion against the Lord. In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Testament lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus is speaking. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm going to focus primarily on the prophet Jeremiah this morning. And I'd like to speak to you a few moments on this thought. Yoked to God's unfolding will. Pray with me. Holy One, in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with the words of my mouth. Give any words that you need. Move me out of the way that the 
people may see you. Be with the meditation of all of our hearts that you may receive honor and glory and we may receive blessing. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Years ago, I came across a brief article in the international section of the newspaper, or maybe the Chicago Tribune, I'm thinking. Uh, a simple account of a tragic incident, yet profound enough that I've never forgotten it. Uh, the dateline was Kiev, Ukraine, and apparently Kiev has a zoo. And at the lion exhibit, uh, apparently a man lowered himself by a rope into the enclosure, and witnesses said he was shouting, God will save me if he exists. And apparently he took off his shoes and approached the lions. And a zoo official was quoted as, as telling what happened next. A lioness went straight for him, knocked him down, and severed his carotid artery. And he died right there at the scene. Now, there are, of course, a lot of ways to react to that story. Uh, it's a tragic loss of life, to be sure. It must have been a terrifying scene. Uh, we can speculate about problems with the man's mental health. Uh, and you know, I, I confess, uh, I can have a dark sense of humor. It, it can even seem darkly humorous, like a scene from an old Monty Python movie or something. Uh, but there are also lessons for us to take from the story, and that's why it stuck with me. Uh, some of them quite simple and straightforward, like, don't ever go into the lion cage, right? But also more profound ones. And what was profound for me is that we need to be very careful when we proclaim or prophesy on God's behalf. Uh, if we're going to speak for God or what God's gonna do, we need not to be glib about it, uh, but should do it with real caution and, and faithfulness so we get it right and there aren't tragic consequences. Indeed, our passage from Jeremiah this morning has everything to do with the tension between right or true prophecy and, on the other hand, false prophecy. In our passage, we find that not unlike that poor chap in Kiev, False prophecy about God and what God's going to do can have consequences that can be fatal. Uh, now, notions of truth and falsehood have very practical implications for us, too, don't they? As a nation, as a society, uh, for the past four years, we have been embroiled in particular, in new ways, I might say. Intentions over truth versus falsehood. We have a sitting president who is almost single-handedly responsible for introducing this concept of false news into the popular vernacular, which is all the more entertaining because of his own penchant, in the opinion of a wide swath of the political spectrum, mind you, for being a pathological liar himself. I mean, it's ironic, but President Trump is probably responsible, if anything, for reinstilling faith and hope in the media uh, so that someone's keeping an eye on things. Uh, and where would we be with, with this guy if it weren't for the papers in the media, I think more people are saying. So truth versus falsehood can matter in a very practical sense in our lives, can't it? And it matters very much to faith, uh, to the Christian faith, to our understanding of God. And so we have in our passage from Jeremiah this morning, a message about true prophecy and false prophecy. Although the story in Jeremiah is a little more complicated than a man climbing into a lion cage, so let's just take a moment to unpack it uh, and to recap what's going on in the passage at this point in Israel's history um, and what's going on between the prophet Jeremiah and this other prophet, Hananiah. Let's, let's talk about that. As we have discussed in the past, the role or position of prophet in the kingdom of Israel uh, could be compared in a way to what in our modern times we call a political advisor to the king. And when you worked for the king, you did want to be sure uh, that you were giving rational and well-informed advice, but you also had a tendency to be politically expedient for the sake of your job. That is to say, you wanted your boss, the king, to be happy with you and feel as though you supported him and his policies. 
So it's not surprising that many of the official prophets of Israel tended to tie their proclamation of God's word to the prevailing political winds. And the reason you have the biblical books of Jeremiah or Isaiah or, or Amos or Micah uh, and you don't have the book of Hananiah is that there were those prophets whose call from God led them to challenge the king in a way that was so profound and so true to God's unfolding will that their prophetic messages were indeed understood to be what saith the Lord and therefore were added to the sacred texts of Israel. Right? So at this point in Israel's history in Jeremiah, the northern state of the uh, nation of Israel um, has been conquered and brought under the control of the Assyrians. Right? And now the new superpower on the scene, Babylon, is looming and threatening to conquer the southern state, Judah, uh, which was Jeremiah's home. And Jeremiah has proclaimed that what saith the Lord about the situation is that Judah should submit to Babylon should not fight, in fact, but should surrender and sign a peace treaty with Babylon because to do otherwise would result in horrible devastation for their nation. And as a public visual aid for his own prophetic message, Jeremiah literally dons a yoke like you'd find on an ox to represent the view of God that Judah should allow itself to be yoked with Babylon. And as a form of protest, uh, he goes about his life each day wearing this yoke around. And along comes this prophet Hananiah, a company man, uh, who says to the king, No, what we need to do is kick butt and take names Israel first and join up with the neighboring nations and go to war against Babylon. We'll make Israel great again and we'll win this thing in two years' time. And in a bit of political melodrama, at one point, Hananiah approaches Jeremiah, rips that yoke off his shoulders, smashes it on the ground as a symbol of his own prophetic message to kick butt. So who was right? Who was true and who was false? A true prophet prophesies what saith the Lord to the people, and not the human will that the people want God to support. The status quo. What keeps everything normal, quote unquote. Let me say that again. A true prophet prophesies what saith the Lord to the people and not the human will that the people want God to support. That is to say, true prophetic speaking or teaching should reflect the ways of God, God's will for humankind that have been embodied and shown to be true through the long historical arc of God's unfolding will. And what has been shown to be true about God's nature and God's will throughout history? What do we as Christians know about how God's will has unfolded? Now we can look at the history of our own Christian faith. As flawed as the church universal and the Christians who comprise it are. Uh, sometimes with tragic and horrific results. Uh, but, but what we see in our own Christian history is an undeniable, continuous trend throughout the history of God's grace, becoming more and more open to and accepting of more and more diverse and even unexpected populations of people. We see God's grace collapsing barriers between people that they may find new ways to coexist and even get along. God's grace breaking through hearts of stone in society after society, in generation after generation, to instill in those hard hearts a sense of justice and compassion and yearning for peace that brings endings to wars and bitter conflict. God's grace making ways out of no way for human civilization to survive and not just survive, but become more and more compassionate. Yes, horrible mistakes have been made by elements in the church or by governing powers manipulating the church. That's true. Times do come when we take barbaric steps backwards. Uh, one glaring example, and I'm talking about religion in general, okay? Uh, one, one glaring example of taking a step backward is this current tragic struggle within Islam. With a small proportion of the worldwide Muslim population embracing, embracing this crazed corruption of Islam's teachings 
in the form of the Islamic extremism we've seen in the past few decades. So we take steps backwards. The Christian faith certainly has. But God is in control, and in time, God's proven will throughout history is of an ever-expanding compassion and charity and justice and peace and equity. And that will prevail. The prophet of God, then, who is called at any given point in history to speak out on what saith the Lord about a given event or a phenomenon or a societal movement, knows this. God may have to shake things up and trouble the waters. Riots may happen. Things will get broken. There will be tension. But it's the birth pangs of moving towards what God is trying to birth for the good of all in this world. Jeremiah knew this back then. He knew that there were times in God's history when the answer wasn't, Take names and kick butt and go to war, but where God is saying, just work for peace. Sometimes you need to bow to Babylon and cooperate so that you can survive. Poor Jeremiah has a tough road to hoe because the king of Israel and the people want to kick butt. And along comes Hananiah, a so-called prophet, saying, yeah, the Lord says kick butt, right? In desperate times when people are struggling, who doesn't want to hear that someone's going to kick butt for them? In desperate times, who doesn't want to hear? We found the answer to all our problems. It's this group of people. Go round them up and get rid of them or incarcerate them, whatever the case may be. Who doesn't want to hear, oh, the last national leader was weak on our enemies, weak on foreign policy and America's rightful place in the world instead of putting America first. Who in desperate times doesn't want to hear, I'm on your side, I'm going to do what's going to make us great again. The Hananiahs of the world, the false prophets, will always have an audience. And many in the public will watch with glee as Hananiah puts on his show, grabbing Jeremiah's yoke and pulling it off and smashing it on the ground. It makes good television finding ever new ways to insult and humiliate and try to discredit his opponents. Imagine if Hananiah had had a Twitter account. God help us. But true prophets, true prophets get inspired to speak out not on behalf of what the popular sentiment is now, the latest societal trends, the current political climate, who's pissed off, who wants to keep things safe for their group, right? But on behalf of of what saith the Lord. A true prophet of God should have as the end goal God's ever expanding compassion and charity and justice and equity and peace. And that may mean that as a prophet, one has to confront issues and speak in a way that troubles the waters, in a way that some might even take as aggressive or confrontational, that might even come across as arrogant, right? Which, of course, is always a point of view, arrogance is. We love to quote the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. these days, right? Uh, for whatever the pet cause is. But in his time, he was constantly branded as what? Arrogant. A troublemaker. Right? A disturber of the peace. Wasn't he? And just as Jeremiah spoke very confrontational, provocative, even aggressive words in the service of preaching what saith the Lord, any preacher, any church leader, I'd add, must be willing to do so. It doesn't mean we aren't seeking peace and justice and compassion in the overall good. It just means that as we proclaim what saith the Lord of love, we might have to engage in tough love at points. Remember, as we talked about at length last week, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew himself acknowledges that his salvation for us, the gospel we, his disciples are to proclaim, is going to bring divisions, even a what? A sword that divides, even loved ones. This must be the burden presumed by anyone who follows him, our cross to take up, as Jesus called it. Though perhaps it is especially true for those who do ministry in his name, not just ministers, but lay people as well doing ministry in his name, preaching, prophesying, 
in his name. And it's also true, as Jesus points out in our short Matthew passage today, that this has implications as well for the people we're trying to reach in our ministry, or those who hear our preaching. Jesus says that one's attitude and level of openness toward those who genuinely come in Jesus' name has consequences for that one. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me, Jesus says, and welcomes the God who sent me. How many of us, laypersons or preachers, or unbelievers whom we're trying to reach, how, how any of us receive the prophetic message of Jesus Christ matters. Jesus says that even small tokens of openness to the message matter. Even just a cup of water shared in the name of a disciple, he says, right? And that's really it. The point is for us just to keep sharing the message so people can hear it and receive it. Keep proclaiming and prophesying however you are called to do. It may be in word or it may just be in a small deed. Keep going to church. Keep worshiping virtually. Keep forgiving. Keep being slow to anger. Boy, is that a tough one in this city. But do it. Pray. Without ceasing. Prayer can bring God's power into even banal moments of every day. And change what happens. Even if it's just changing your attitude, your temperament. Pray without ceasing. Be quick to love instead. Keep showing kindness. The point is, keep bearing the light. Keep prophesying to Jesus. If we find ourselves dropping the ball, or God forbid, opposing that, we might just as well be dropping ourselves into the lion cage at a zoo. At least spiritually, anyway. And our circumstances cut us off at the jugular. Or the Quran. And we can't just expect God to save us when we're the ones who jumped into the cage. Right? The thing is, don't get bogged down in the now of the world around us, however crushing it might feel, overwhelming, exhausting. Don't get caught up in the whims of public opinion. As important as social and political change are, and we've got a lot of that happening right now, don't lose focus on the cross you are called to bear, proclaiming the truth of Christ's gospel to the world around us, in word or in deed, prophesying to the eternal, continuous unfolding of God's will that is always defined by ever-expanding compassion and charity and justice and peace and equity for all. That's all there is to being a prophet. We might find comfort in some guidance today in the words of El Salvador's late Roman Catholic Archbishop, Oscar Romero. Romero was a true prophet of God's social justice and compassion who, because of his own prophetic words and work you may know, was assassinated while distributing the Eucharist at his church in San Salvador in 1988. Romero once wrote, it helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. We cannot do everything and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that, Romero said. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own." End quote. Friends, may we always receive and heed the true prophet of God. Be she or he a preacher, a teacher, an elder, a layperson, a stranger, and be willing to yoke ourselves to God's unfolding will when it manifests itself. Understanding that the future is not ours, 
but the magnificent enterprise of compassion and charity and justice and peace and equity for all that is God's grace. Amen. Uh, pray with me. Holy One, we could easily be overwhelmed at the responsibility that the church has, that each of us as believers has, for carrying the torch, bearing the light of your gospel in this world. But you are with us. It's all we need to know, Lord, when we wake up each morning to know you are with us. And so I have the power to be able to say yes, Lord. I say yes to you. Help me by any word I, you might give me or any small deed I might do today to prophesy to Jesus that folks may hear and may see and may respond to the one who is come in your name, Jesus. Grant that it may be so and empower and, em and em enable us, trusting in you, to let it be so. Amen. Stay faithful in your giving and uh, your support of the ministry and mission of Union Church. We need you uh, and for you to continue to give out of the goodness of your hearts and as you are called. Uh, feel free to mail your offerings to us or if you prefer, arrange for me to meet you here during the week uh, and bring it in person. It would be great to see you. Uh, moving on, uh, let us now go to our holy God, our caring, merciful God uh, in prayer together. Let us pray. Eternal God, our rock and redeemer, we praise and thank you for the gift of life this day, for breath in our lungs and another day to live in your grace. Lord, we begin today with our own congregation and our needs. I lift to you, Isabel, recovering from surgery this week for healing. And along with her, those suffering from injury or chronic pain, and those with addictions or mental illness. We ask that you work through the gifts of science and medicine to bring healing. Work through treatment. Lord, place the right people in lives that there may be stability. And be a divine physician as only you can to bring comfort and peace of mind to them. Lord, I've spoken with church members who are tired, who are frustrated, feeling isolated, disconnect from the people and places and activities that they love and enjoy. Uh, some of our people are out of work because of this pandemic, unsure of what's next, wondering what steps to take. Holy God, we are in grief, some of us, because we knew someone who passed away from complications of the coronavirus. We're grieving how much things simply have changed. Lord, help. 
and strengthen us. We trust you. We need you. Be present to us. Inspire us and instill a light of hope in us. Send your Holy Spirit to fill us with your presence that we may know and feel we are not alone. For you are with us and there is nothing we face that you don't face with us and carry us through. Lord, grant us all your patience and tenderness and love, especially those in families still having to stay at home together so much of the time. Help us be kind, Lord. Be a wonderful counselor, God, where there are broken and hurting relationships. Lord, help them toward reconciliation. We ask you look with care upon our world, Almighty God, and that you extend your power into this world to contain coronavirus. We are thankful for answered prayer in places like New York where progress has been made, but we're mindful of the places where the virus is worsening. Lord, work through the gifts of science and medicine, doctors and nurses and technology to overcome and bring under control this virus. We ask you to heal all those who are ill, especially in communities of color where the virus has struck disproportionately. Be with and comfort those grieving loved ones and friends. And we ask that you look upon all who are frontline workers in the midst of COVID-19 and the outbreak for your divine hedge of protection to be placed around them. Keep them in good health, Lord, and their families. God of justice, we lift up to you the persecution we have seen in Asian communities in recent months. Protect and strengthen them, Lord. Stay the hands and actions of those who would hurt and insult because of bigotry and fear. Transform their hearts with your love, Lord. And we continue to pray for African American and other communities of color in this crucial moment in history for our nation of seeking justice. We pray again that you rebuke and cast out white racism and supremacy and that you cast out the injustices in law enforcement across this nation. Transform and inspire cities and communities in our land to institute practices that value life as we maintain public order. And rebuke and restrain the sinful thoughts and hurtful actions of those of our fellow citizens poisoned by racial and cultural bigotry and hate. And bring peace, Lord, and respect and equity. And we pray, O oh God, that you bring justice in the prosecution of the lynchings of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia, and in the deaths of Breonna Taylor and David McAtee in Louisville, Manuel Ellis in Tacoma, and in all circumstances where innocent or unarmed people of color continue to experience disproportionate injury and death, whether by law enforcement or our fellow citizens, that the people of our nation may know that justice here is possible. And be with this land, be with our nation, Lord. Guide us all, especially in this election year, to increase love and cooperation, the willingness to empathize on all sides, banish hate and intolerance and ignorance. Help us to coexist in ever greater peace and mutual respect and together move this nation toward opportunity, equity and justice for the most possible. We ask it all in the name of that Jesus, our Lord who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Our charge today... is to be open. Be open to receive the prophetic proclamation of our Lord's unfolding will. Be ready to carry the torch of that proclamation in all that you do, in all that you say. It's not an overwhelming task when you remember who's with you, the risen Jesus Christ power of God Almighty is within you and the person of Jesus and the power of Holy, the Holy Spirit that surrounds you and the knowledge that God, our Creator, is with you. Go forth 
and prophesy in the ways that you are called, that the world may hear it. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.